her. So can, can I ask yeah. you to quote that bottom? Someone at the door? No. 16th chapter, Divine and Devilish Estates. And in the beginning, Krishna was saying, here are the divine qualities. Arjuna, you got them. You're going to get liberated. Then we're going to look at all these terrible devilish qualities. And these guys suck. And they're going to go into lower life forms and things like that. If we look at just that exoteric understanding of the chapter, it's not very useful. It's not very useful. So this time through, we've been looking at it through the lens of second chapter of Yoga Sutra, the first sutra, which is Tapa Swadhyayeshwara Pranidhana Kriya Yoga. Tapas, austerity. Swadhyaya, my own self study. Ishwara Pranidhana, trustful surrender to God, is called yoga in action. And we're going to take it from the middle part and peel it apart. Swadhyaya, again, one definition that we have of Swadhyaya is our own self study of the scripture going reviewing the scripture after we've learned them in class and attempting to apply them to our lives. But Patanjali's understanding of Swadhyaya, which literally just means self-study, is the capacity to inventory our own psychological material. This is not always done in red ink. We have character assets and character defects. These divine qualities are our character assets. These demoniacal qualities are, a little softer way to look at it, our kleshas. Kleshas means our afflictions. Doshas, our defects. Dosha is also a word that's used in Ayurveda medicine. And it means, you know, a, a disease. So we take this whole idea, oh, I'm such a terrible creature, I'm just going to go to hell. I think I'll just shoot heroin. That makes it all easier. That becomes useless. Becomes useless. So this Swadhyaya is the capacity to Stay in the viewpoint of the witness and take a look at what our mind is doing without any kind of pejorative judgment. We just want to see what our mind is doing. What do we do with that? Going back to the first word, tapas. Tapas means austerity. Many of you who are Hindus do austerities. You may stay up late and chant for uh, Navaratri. You may um, uh, stay up all night for Shivaratri. You may do various pujas, various yajnas for all the various religious holidays. But if the rest of the time your mind habitually goes into negative thinking, nobody loves me, everybody hates me, think I'll go eat worms, or oh, what's going to happen? My future, it's so, oh, I'm so frightened, I'm just paralyzed, I don't know what to do, or oh, how could I have said or done that in the past? Oh, I'm such a terrible person, or Oh, I had such a terrible childhood. I was abused here and traumatized there. My terrible relatives, my terrible in-laws. And you spend time doing that. 
I tell you, your time is much better spent dealing with those glaciers than it is with ritual. All of us have seen religious people go to the temple, go to the church, go to the synagogue, and they are religiously observant, and then they come out into the parking lot and they scream and yell at their neighbor. It's, it's pointless, it's pointless. So what do we do? What do we do? I'm not saying not to be religiously observant. If it feeds your heart and, and, and mind, by all means. But what is it that's going to free us from these glaciers, these afflictions? Tapas, austerity. Now, the yogic meaning of tapas is the willingness and the effort, the guru sharta, the self-effort, to change the habituated flow of our thought and action. Now, as a yogi, this is where I personally see the short-sightedness of psychology. Go to the psychologist and have an issue and find out, oh, such and such happened to me as a child. This was because of my mother or my crazy uncle. Now I know why. That can be of value. But it rarely allows us to change anything. I just have some understanding of why this triggers me. What do I need to do? Stop us. <coughs> when the mind starts to go down those negative chains of thought, you will know it. And you move it into a new chain of thinking. Trevor, may I share a little bit about our conversation before class? Of course. So Trevor was sharing with me that he's going off to Santa Cruz. And he was sharing with me, you know, he, like many of us going off to an environment, have social awkwardness. Now, what does the ego mind say? I'm socially awkward. I find social situations so painful. I have a hard time making friends. What do I do? I think I'll just sit against the wall and cross my arms and maybe read a book or not go to the social function at all. Does that sound familiar to any of you? Yes. So what I suggested to him was tapas. You replace the thought and action with something new. This is old stuff. You know how to be the best of all conversationalists? Take an interest in other people. The psychological position, how am I doing? Am I okay? What do they think of me? Oh, I'm such a nerd. That's the most painful position of the mind. Instead, take a genuine interest in other people. Do not seek to impress them. Seek to take an interest in them, to love them, basically. Then, when you're at a social event, seva. What does seva mean? So I suggest that if you're at a college party, you're feeling uncomfortable, try picking up all the empty glasses and taking them to the kitchen and washing them. 
if they've had food or hors d'oeuvres, pick up the plates, wash them. If the relish trays or the chips need to be refilled, ask the host, can I help you refill this, that, or the other thing? Useful activity of service gets us out of ourselves, the small self here. This is puppets. What do we mean? We do a different thought and action. And it can be something simple, like I was listening to a friend talk about how at his work environment, for years, everybody just gossiped, trash talked the management. Any of you ever been in a work environment where that has happened? Yeah. It's painful. It's really uncomfortable after a while, isn't it? Yeah. We don't have to participate. But we have to do the toughest. We can't make other people stop gossiping. But we can stop doing it. We can either read the situation or change the subject. Or say nothing. But we don't have to participate and then complain about the gossip that we participate. So this is a practical tool. First, swadhyaya, become conscious, become aware of what your strengths and weaknesses are. Last week, I think we talked about punya and papa. Punya is usually described as merit, doing such and such ritual exercises, bathing, giving alms, all this sort of stuff. Papam sin, things that make me ritually impure. But the yogic definition, things we engage in, thought and action, that serves to purify the mind. To bring me peace. That's punya. Things that I do that separate me from the love of God and the love of other people that grossify my mind. That's Papa. So, playing with yourself is not a sin. Self obsessed fear is think many people have all sorts of nonsense become aware swadhyaya endeavor to change the flow And frequently, it helps to just take one issue. I'm just going to work on this character. Uh, I have control issues. I keep wanting to control situations. I'm just going to really work on letting it be, trusting that it's all going to work out. That brings us into the third practice, Ishwara Pranidhana, trustful surrender to God. Now, my experience is the chief activator of all my character defects is self centered fear. Afraid I'm not going to get what I want. Afraid I'm going to. What I have. Afraid it's not going to go my way. Sound familiar? All the rest comes from that. 
I'm frightened because I see a meaningless universe. I see a meaningless universe because I'm in competition with God. Ishwara Pranidhana, trustful surrender to God. That fear starts to melt away. We turn the issue over to God. Turn, yes. So, my struggle is that I don't really have strong beliefs in God. Mm -hmm. like I, don't don't, I don't practice religion or anything. You don't have to. Okay, so what do you... You start by saying the words. You get up in the morning and you say, okay, to whom it may concern. <laughs> I, today, I'm going to give this day to you. Today, I want to be an instrument of whoever or whatever's out there. There's still a belief in a higher power. Only thing you need to know is your ego is not in. Yeah. Because the, the state of egoism, Ishwara Baba, it's called, I think I'm God. I think I'm important. It's stupid because you're so impotent. If you just look, go out to the ocean and try to make a wave stop coming in. Just try it. Are you very successful in anything like that? No. Was it too hot last week for you? No. Yeah. How successful were you in making it cooler? <coughs> I mean, it's clear your ego is not very powerful. And yet, oh, I keep trying to make it powerful. And How's that working out? It's exhausting is what it is. Anybody know what codependence is? Anybody here study any of that? A codependent is a person who their life isn't working and think the problem is other people. So the solution is to just try to fix and control and change other people. I'm a wreck. <laughs> Because nobody out there is doing it right. <laughs> <coughs> Anybody go through that one? Yeah. Swamiji used to say, graveyards are filled with indispensable people. <laughs> or here's another wonderful practice. If you think you're just a little bit smarter than everybody and you have the answer that's really the best in most situations, go for a week without giving your opinion unless someone asks for it. And what's so humbling, if you're like me, nobody asks. <laughs> Helps us be right size. Swadhyaya. Self examination, an inventory process. If Socrates said the unexamined life is not worth living, everyone who successfully practices the spiritual life develops the habit. The daily practice of the swadhyaya, the self examination. Now, again, it's not always done in red ink. You also need to know what your strengths are. That doesn't make you better or smarter. It's just, okay, I'm doing better with that one. Swadhyaya, compass, 
Ishwara Pranidhana. Self-examination. Tapas, the austerity of endeavoring to change. Uh, Jim? Yes. I have a question. Um, how do we accurately um, assess ourselves like without just going into preconceived notions of who we are. Give me an example. Like, um, like how how do we judge whether we're um, self-centered in a certain way? If like we or how do we judge if 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 we uh, are egotistical if we're beating ourselves up? all the time. Well, humility is not thinking less of yourself. That's a form of pride. Did you hear that? Yeah. That means I am worse than the next person. Start with the notion that my mind is basically just like everybody else's. I'm just an ordinary guy. Humility is not thinking less of yourself. That's false humility. That's called self-deprecation. In the uh, Christian monastic tradition, it's called scrupulation. It's not a wonderful word. Oh, I, I had an impure thought. I think I should just do all this penance today because, oh, I just had one pure thought this morning during breakfast. Not yet. Forget it, you know. <laughs> That's some grandiose idea of your own perfectionism. Does that make sense? Yes. So you have the skills to do this. Now, what you can do for most of it, it's a value to have a, what the, the, the monastic traditions call an amicus alma. Anybody here know Latin? No. Alma is soul, amicus is friend, a friend of my soul. Is that a wonderful term? So in the monastic tradition, this would be in the brother monk that you could share with. Might be your confessor, but it didn't have to be. Might be someone in the Sangha that you trust. And he said, you know, I just have this idea that I think I have this glacier, this uh, affliction. Blah, 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 blah. They might say, yeah, I've seen you do that. Or they might say, that's stupid. Everybody does that. Don't worry about it. And you had a little feedback. Is that making sense? Yes. Well, it's a useful thing. It's a useful thing. That's this taking refuge in the Sangha. Who is talking? Very useful. It's very useful. So with this three-part practice, tapaswadhyayeshwara pranidhana kriya yoga, tapas, the austerity of endeavoring to change the habituated negative thought patterns into healthier flows of thinking. What do we, how do we do this? Swadhyaya, through our own inventory process. And can't do it on our own. We have to have trustful surrender to God. It's a marvelous, marvelous frame for practice especially as we study in the 16th chapter, these qualities of the demoniac and the qualities of, that are divine. Because most of us have some of both. And the mind's not rigid. Some days a little later than others. Thank you.
All right, what verse are we on? I think it's 16 or 17, isn't it, Mark? 14. Which one? 14. 14, okay. Will you help us out, please, Deepa? Yes. We're, we're going through the demon stuff now. Yep. Sorry, I can't find my, oh, here. Uh, Jim, I have a new laptop, so I'm not able to share my screen for everyone. I'm sorry, That's but I can read. Asau maya hata shatrur hanishe cha paranapi ishwaro raham aham bhogi siddho ham balwan sukhi that enemy has been slain by me, and others also shall I destroy. I am the Lord. I am the enjoyer. I am perfect, powerful, and happy. So here we have this idea that if I base my identity on what I have done in the world, see, Ego's problem is that it's not real. It's an event. The word in Sanskrit is ahankara, ahankriti. Aham just means first person pronoun. Kara comes from the root to make or to do, pre. So it's the kind of thinking that gives us this phony sense of I. But it's never still. We always get the metaphor of the flame. The flame is actually dynamic. It's constantly oxidizing gases. So questions like, are you happy? It's stupid. I, I, I'm happy, and then my nose itches, and I'm thinking about doing the laundry, and then um, I'm hungry, and then I'm a little bit bored, and then I'm sleepy, and then I'm having fun thinking about who I'm going to spend the evening with. Isn't that what your mind does in my mind? It's nothing static. Always. But because it's always moving, and deep inside the self in me, it is kutusta, it never moves. But because I don't know that's who I am, Ego is always trying to secure itself and make itself okay. So if everybody gives you positive feedback and you do a good job on a paper at school and your husband likes what you fix for dinner, you're okay. But then if everybody ignores you and have a lousy day at school, and your husband's pissed off at you. Oh, I have a piece of crap. That's what our mind does. So the demoniac is constantly trying to engage in activity and then attributes the results of that activity to self, to be okay. So let's parse this. The first one is I slay my enemies. Was that the first one, Deepa? That enemy has been slain by me. Yeah, Passable. look what I did. All right, pretty hot. Now, this can also mean I did very well on the test, or I have now gotten this degree. I have accomplished this uh, project and work and everything. 
clap for that little presentation. I'm okay. This is the kind of ego thinking that gets us in trouble. What's the second thought? And others also shall I destroy. No, this enemy has been slain by me. Others also shall I destroy. Yeah. So get out of my way. I always think of, of God bless it, the former president. Such a vengeful man. Clearly managed by fear. God help you if you cost him. He would destroy you if he could. And all of us may have this quality. You know, one of the things ego does is it will hide a negative motive behind a good one. Well, I just want to point out to my partner what he's doing. Showing him what it's like. Well, what I'm really doing is I'm hurt and I'm feeling vengeful. You ever caught yourself doing that? Punish other people. So you may not destroy other people, but we all lash out and hurt others because we feel hurt. That's a play show. That's not healthy boundaries. That's a problem. Teaching people a lesson. It's vengeance. Let's call it what it is. So in all these things, Gita here will, will do the most extreme form of it. But if we're honest, we'll see, yeah. At times I've done that, I have subtler forms of it. Next ideas, Deepa. I am the Lord. I am the enjoyer. Yes. Look at me. I'm so powerful. Look what I've done. Get out of my way. I am. All this is exactly the opposite of what we were talking about at the beginning of class, this Ishwara Pranidhana, this trustful surrender to God, this turning of my will and my life over to God's care. Good morning, God. This is Jim reporting for duty. I can. He can, I think I'll let him. All sorts of little handy slogans. Which is the opposite of, of now on, we're going to do things my way. Is that all the ideas in this verse? Uh, no, there's one more. Okay. I, am I am perfect, powerful, and happy. Looking good. I am perfect. Oh, perfectionism is such a burden. How many of us will not pursue dream because we can't do it 
perfectly the first time. I have several dear friends who are professional writers. 201, they say, well, you don't really ever really write anything. You rewrite and rewrite and but how many of us have stared at a blank page and we put down two sentences and said that sucks and we never touch it again. Perfectionism is a pleasure. It's an affliction. It is not a character asset. And Another one of my favorite slogans. You can't save your face and your ass at the same time. <laughs> what does that mean? To save your ass, to try to get well, to try to live a happy life. You have to give up trying to look good. So I tell people, don't Try to be spiritual. It's a heavy burden. Instead, strive for authenticity. Doesn't mean not to do practice. But I think many of us have been at spiritual functions where everybody's got a good on smile, everybody's fine. And uh, do you see how holy I am? And let me tell you all the gurus <laughs> I've seen. And, oh, yes. And, and, and I'm doing this and teaching this. You know, blah, blah, blah. Have you ever been to places like that? <laughs> boring. Because everybody's a phony. Strive for authenticity. All right, next verse. That's verse 15. Adyo bhija nava nasmi gonyosti sadrushomaya yakshe dasyami modisha ityagyana vimohitaha. I am rich and well born. Who else is equal to me? I will give alms or money. I will rejoice. Thus are they deluded by ignorance. So these are those who their self-worth is tied up with the cash and the prizes. Social environment. You know, it's funny. My father always told me that a gentleman wears the label of his clothes on the inside, not on the outside. Calvin Klein, Prada. Isn't that what so many of us do? I want other people to know that I'm wearing expensive clothes. The labels are on the outside. I drive a Porsche. I drive like an old lady, but I want everybody to know that I can afford a Porsche. I'm social. Oh, yes, we went skiing in Switzerland this past year. Telling people what you've done, where you've been, what you own. Some people are influenced by that. People are attracted to the rich and the powerful.
but it's useless. It's a useless thing. It's not about character. So I am rich and powerful. What's the next idea? Who else is equal to me? Everybody know I'm better than you. And sometimes we don't say it out loud, but we run around with this idea of, oh, I'm, you know, just a little bit smarter than everybody else. I don't have to obey those rules because I'm just a little bit smarter than everybody else. Or young people, another one we do is vanity, spending hours in front of the mirror and makeup and hair and arranging this and that with your clothing. Beauty is very powerful. Next idea. I will give arms and money. Yes. So this is when we take virtuous activity and we play the big shot with it. Many, many years ago in the, the uh, 1980s, I sang up at Grace Cathedral in the Grace Cathedral Choir of Men and Boys. And they're blazoned in gold and bronze on the floor of the sanctuary by the high altar was this medallion and it said, to the glory of God and in memory of William J. Crocker. <laughs> he was almost important as God. <laughs> you know, Crocker family gave the land a whole lot of money to build that cathedral and they wanted everybody to know it. And if you go to the symphony or the opera, and what is in the back of the program? The donor list. These people gave more than $10,000. These people more than $5,000. These people more than 1000 These people more than 500 And then down here are all the peons who gave between 100 and 500 <laughs> What do you see people? Oh, I want to look to see what my name is. What people to know they're important. Chance. Now, you should give. You should give for a couple of reasons. First of all, it is one of the deepest psychological tools to get rid of the fear of financial insecurity. Because money is an energy, it's not a thing. And if you're fearful, you're gonna hold on to it and you get spiritually constipated. So we have to let the energy out. So it is a value to give. In the ancient Hebrew tradition and many Christian traditions followed it, you had the idea of a tithe. You can tell me what a tithe is. It's where you give like 10% of your, of your income to the church. Yeah, so God is what you're supposed to give it. But, uh, now, what I will tell you you don't have to start with 10%. Start with like 1% or 
half a percent. But if you start the practice of giving away a certain amount of money, the first fruits per se 0.5%. Start the very practice of this dana. Who can tell me what dana is? It also means generosity. Now, you can give it to the place where you get your spiritual support if you wish, but you don't have to. You can give it to the things where you get fed. You can give it to the ACLU. You can give it to Doctor Without Borders. You can give it to your local neighborhood garden. You can uh, give it to a homeless shelter. You can give it to a food bank. The church, of course, wants so you know it that way. But I tell you, people who begin the practice of proper dana, the fear of financial insecurity goes away. Find that there's always enough. Illusion is. The reason I'm fearful is I just am not making enough money. No amount of zeros gets rid of the fear. But giving to impress people because you're wealthy, you want people to know you can do it. That doesn't work. So what's the next idea? I rejoice. Yes. I'm very happy because I am comfortable. I have gold toilets. Next idea. Thus are they deluded by ignorance. Thus they are deluded by you. So the root of all of this is the difference between the bogey and the yogi. We went into this last week. Let me review it. A bogey practices bhoga, which means enjoyment. A yogi practices yoga, which means union. Both the bogey and the yogi want to be happy. The bogi practicing boga tries to be happy by satisfying as many desires as possible. Gimme, 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 more, better, different. I want, I want, I want. Greed, greed, fill me up, fill me up, fill me up. Got the house, the dog, now the Porsche's house. Then the boyfriend or the girlfriend. More, more, more. The problem with Boga, the end result of it is more desires. Who's ever had enough money? Swamiji always used to say, if sex were satisfying, we'd only do it once. And we begin as a bogey to develop addictive relationships for life. Must have this, and if it isn't to my satisfaction, God, do I suffer. The yogi also wants happiness, but the yogi engages in a way of life that reduces 
the number of desires entertained, such that what's left over is what we call sambhushama, contentment. The yogi, she is content with what she has. Tim, I have a question. Yes, please. So, uh, with respect to the discussion of bhogi and yogi, like you said just now that the yogi is content with what she has and reduces the number of desires so that what is there is enough. So with respect to material desires, uh, I understand that. But one of the things that I struggle with in practice is, uh, you know, with respect to desire, like creative desires, like, uh, mm -hmm. for example, you know, in uh, scientific work, or, you know, if, like if if one is an artist then in wanting to create better art uh, or better music in things like that uh, what i find in practice is that uh, even there an addictive relationship develops and at least for me uh, and i i think it becomes difficult because this is something that the world actually uh, appreciates but the it, it is still an addictive relationship. So it seems uh, in contradiction with yoga, but at the same time, uh, it, it's, it's difficult to deal with. Well, only you can discern whether or not it agitates your mind or brings you peace. It agitates the mind, for sure. Then let's look at it. That's what I would, what you need to do is the swadhyaya. See if you can look at what the klesha is. Where are you attached? Where do you have expectation? Where do you have identification? Doesn't mean necessarily to cease the activity, but where can you let go and let go? Can I ask a question? Let me finish one thing. Let me give you an example. So there was a time in my youth, Shweta, when I really wanted to be a famous opera star. And it caused me great pain because I don't sing that well. I'm a good musician, I'm a journeyman, but I do not have the God-given instrument and I did not have the punya, the luck, the merit to get the kind of training in my early days and I had to let it go at one point. That's not what God had in mind for me. Now, what was the other question? Who is that there? Is that Katie? Um, no, it's Susanna. And- Hi, um, Susanna. It's, hi. It's not really a question that's different. It, it's a question to the person um, who is just, you know, vulnerably expressing the anxiety of trying to perfect through science, art, and music. I can't hear you because there's a motorcycle going by. All right, oh, I'm so sorry. Talk. Now talk. Okay. So I wanted to just speak to the lady who was expressing um, having anxiety through, you know, the pursuit of perfection, you know, with the art and music and science. And I mean, for what it's worth, it's human nature that, um, you know, whatever we do and do and do that we naturally get better at it. And so for me, thinking about the question, I'm like, well, if the pursuit for the perfection is to win the award, right? Or to, um, you know, get all the praise and have your name on the headline, then that would be the more negative thing that um, our guru is talking about. But if it, I believe, just like meditating over and over and over, studying, you know, to learn the mind and these teachings, right? It's, it's a, an honorable 
a notable pursuit. And so I see the arts in a similar way. And, you know, as our guru said, it's essentially going to be, you know, a question that you need to ask and work with for yourself. But I just wanted to maybe offer, you know, some other insight in hopes that, you know, maybe it'll help ease some of that. Good points. Good points. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And again, we have our swadharma, whatever the life path is for you. Certainly strive for excellence. But that's different than perfectionism. And just as Susanna, is that right? Yes, correct. Sorry, I'm eating. Was saying we don't if your if your goal is to be a celebrity or to be famous or to win a prize, that's different than doing the science or doing the art. Okay, going on. Next verse. Aneka chitta vibhranta. Mohajala samavrita prasakta kama bhogeshu patanti narakeshu cho. Bewildered by many a fancy, entangled in the snare of delusion, addicted to the gratification of lust, they fall into a foul hell. And I don't know why Swamiji used the word lust, because it, it's kama is the word he's using, is it not? Kama bhogeshu, yes. Yeah, kama bhogeshu, yes. So it means craving. So it's not just sexual. It's I want, I want, I want. And we go to the Four Noble Truths of Buddha, the First Noble Truth, the truth of Dukkha. Life, the way most people live it, is suffering, Dukkha. The cause of my suffering is kama, craving. Sangraha, attachment, Krishna, thirsting. What does it feel like to want something you don't have? It hurts. The flip side, aversion. I want to get rid of something I don't like. Or the neurotic form. I have what I want, but I'm afraid I'm going to lose it. And we're like a person at a banquet with a thorn in their throat. Noble truth number three, freedom from craving is freedom from suffering. In a worldly experience, I experience that freedom two ways. The moment I satisfy a desire, the desire goes away. I got what I want. I also experience it every night when I go to sleep. And there, we see something very interesting. At night, no object has caused the freedom from suffering, the happiness. It's the folding up of the mind. And then the, is there a way to be permanently free from suffering? We said, yes, that's the Eightfold Path. No way. Same thing. So we reduce the addictive quality of the mind. Doesn't mean we don't act in the world. But this sangraha, this, this grasping, this clinging, this attachment, that's what's being All right. Next one. Atma sambhavita stabtha dhanamana madanvita yajante nama yajyaste dambhe na vidhi purvakam. Self conceited, stubborn, filled with pride and drunk with wealth, they perform sacrifices in name only out of ostentation, contrary to scriptural ordinance. So, drunk with wealth, with pride, with ostentation, 
this idea of drunkenness means I'm deluded. I do not see what's really there. I always think of that marvelous tale of the emperor's new clothes. I'm sure you all remember it. These people come to the capital and they say we have this magic cloth that only wise people can see. But of course, nobody wants to admit that they're not wise. So they say, oh, is it that lovely? Look at the texture of the fabric. Oh, the thread is so fine. And they know they can't see it, but they don't want to admit. So eventually they're taken to the palace. The emperor doesn't want to admit that he can't see it. Oh, judge fine cloth, etc. So they make him a suit of clothes. And then he goes in parade down the main street of the capital to show everyone his new clothes. Of course, nobody wants to admit they can't see it. Oh, look at the king's new clothes. Oh, they are so fine. Finally, there's a child who turns to his mummy and says, Mummy, look at the king. He's stark naked. <laughs> This story is about Olga. What you and I do is compare our insides to other people's outsides. I look at the person with the award. I look at the person with all the money. I look at the person whose husband or wife is so beautiful. I look at the couple that has the the gorgeous children. I look at the person with the car or who takes their cruise and I think, oh, they must be so happy. And of course, they'll tell you how happy they are. But then at home, behind closed doors, they have the same suffering as everybody does lives life as a bogey. You and I, oh, we're just not doing it right. And the child is the guru. Look, everybody's suffering. And they're pretending that they're not. Very important idea. Now, we have our four brahmanas, our four authorities. The scriptures say there is a way out. We have the recorded evidence, the Shmriti, of all the saints and sages through history. The Ramana Maharshis, Chinmayas. So far, it's proven true for me. Third, your own logical reason. Real spirituality is profound common sense. Finding your own. Because the spiritual life looks weird to the people out there. Still living life is boba. Okay, what verse are we on, Deepa? 17. Okay. I, I think we'll end here tonight. Om Pur Namada Pur Namitam Pur Nat Pur Namudachane
ಪೂರ್ಣಸ್ಯ ಪೂರ್ಣಮಾ ಪೂರ್ಣಮೇವಶಿಷ್ಯ ಶಾಂತಿ 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 ಹಾರಿ ಓಂ ಶ್ರೀ ಗುರುಭ್ಯೋ ನಮಃ ಹಾರಿ ಓಂ ತಪ ಸ್ವಧ್ಯಾಶ್ವರ ಫಲಿತಾನ ಪ್ರಿಯ ಯೋಗ ತಪಸ್ವಸ್ತರಿ ಸ್ವಧ್ಯಾಯ ಸೌಶ್ವರ ಫಲಿತಾನ ಟ್ರಸ್ಟ್ಫುಲ್ ಸುಲೆಂಡರ್ ಟು ಗಾಡ್ ಯೋಗ ಇನ್ ಆಕ್ಷನ್ very very important sutra and fits so well with this chapter any other thoughts just thank you thank you so much thank you come back thank you jim <laughs> thank you jim how do you all stay namaste, namaste.